in the building tonight. Your word declares, be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known unto God. So Lord, we make our needs known to you. We, we speak them tonight in prayer. We call them out to you in prayer. And Lord, in faith, we couple that by calling on the name of Jesus. God, I am praying that the power resident in your name that we just sang about I pray in your name, Jesus, that it would come to bear. Lord, that it would begin to move on behalf of every individual in this room that is bringing a situation to you tonight. We do believe it is the birthright of the people of God that we have the privilege of bringing our needs to you. And peace that passes understanding can keep our hearts and minds in Jesus Christ. Lord, that the miraculous can begin to flow. And I pray that it would. I pray that you'd reverse diagnosis tonight. And God, I'm praying that you'd resolve family circumstances. And God, I am asking that you would open up financial opportunities. And, and God, that you'd open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that we would not have room enough to contain. In Jesus' name, we pray over all of these needs. And God, we pray over this service tonight. For every individual in-house, every individual that is tuning in online tonight, I pray that your spirit would minister. God, I am praying that your word would convict and challenge and that we would not leave the same way that we came. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I feel that faith and I feel the presence of the Lord as we prayed. It's just moving in this room. Can we just entertain him for a few more moments? God, we give you thanks. We give you thanks, God. Oh, we give you thanks, Jesus. God, we thank you for hearing us when we pray. Come on, if you're thankful that the God of heaven, he hears us when we pray, can you just worship him? Can you thank him for that? Hallelujah. And everybody shout in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated tonight. We're going to get into worship again in a moment. One more song. And uh, we just want to say, if you're a guest with us in house tonight, please take a moment on your way out of service. If you didn't on the way into service, we would love to connect with you and to put a small gift, a token of our appreciation in your hands. And you can do all of that at the center welcome desk on your way out through the foyer. And so we invite you to do that if you haven't already. And to all the guests, can we make them feel welcome tonight at Bible study? Amen. You may not know this, but simultaneous to this service, we have our students meeting out in our youth chapel. We have kids meeting in our lower auditorium, and so there's something for the whole family Wednesday evenings at CCC. And so um, if you didn't know that, now you know, we invite you to bring the whole family here, any service, but certainly tonight as well. And I want to make you aware of a few announcements. Please keep in mind our Friday evening prayer service in a couple of days, Friday at 7 p.m., looking ahead to Sunday, excited to have Pastor Jack preaching in the morning service, 10 a.m., and Pastor Mike uh, preaching in the evening service at 6 p.m. As we look ahead to the coming weeks, next Wednesday, April 17th, we're excited to have guest speaker Rachel, Rachel Coltharp with us. And that's going to be a great Wednesday evening, and she'll be here for our ladies' conference. Now, that's a district event, but that is happening uh, April 19th and 20th. It's a Friday and a Saturday, and you can visit AtlanticLadies.com if you're interested in attending that, ladies. It's a great conference, and we're privileged to host that right here on campus, April 19 and 20. And then on Sunday, April 21st, uh, we'll have Brother Baron Longstreth with us in both of those services, 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. And the final announcement that I'll leave you with is for all of the parents that are in the room tonight that currently your students are, in fact, in the youth service, Two weeks from right now, on April 24th, we are having a parents' night. Our youth team will be meeting with, uh, instead of the students out there and the parents in here, we're going to switch that. And the parents will be with our youth team, and the students will be in here for that Wednesday evening. So that's two weeks from today, on April 24th. And so please mark your calendars, parents in particular, and be mindful of that. And it's going to be a, a great night where you get to connect with our youth staff, and they can share some vision and some things that are on the horizon in our youth ministry. And uh, that is the announcements for this evening. Again, such an honor to have everybody in the house tonight. We're going to go before the Lord with another song. We're going to worship. Our ushers are going to come, and they're going to receive an offering this evening. 
and we pass the plate for the convenience of those uh, in in the, the building tonight, but many of you participate in giving digitally via online, and so whatever your method and mode, we invite you to give. It's a form of our worship, and let's sing together. Ushers, come. God bless you. Open your heart to the Word in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Sing. Lord, I'm amazed by you. Lord, I'm amazed. I'm amazed by you. How you love me. How you love me.
Would you take a moment right now and would you lift up your praise to the Lord? Tell him how amazing he is. Tell him how valuable he is to you. Tell him how precious and powerful his name is in your life. I love you, Jesus, and I worship you. I love you, God, and I worship you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I worship you, God. I want to add my voice to uh, what Pastor Matt was announcing. We have some uh, wonderful special guests and special events coming up. Uh, Sister Rachel Coltharp, uh, Brent and Rachel uh, Coltharp lead not only their church in uh, Aurora, Illinois, just outside of Chicago, not only is he the district superintendent of uh, the Illinois district, but he is the president of Urshan College and uh, just a wonderful couple. Rachel is one of the most profound ladies uh, in her writing and her speaking that you will ever encounter, and we're going to be blessed by her ministry uh, that upcoming Wednesday night. And the long stress, Baron and Raina have started a church and now pastor a growing, thriving church in Tulsa, and uh, you're going to really enjoy uh, Brother uh, Longstress' ministry as well. He's preached at one church in Halifax, and we're honored to have all of those folks there. I'm honored to be with all of you tonight, and for those of you that uh, are uh, regular Bible study attenders, uh, we are heading into the last part of the Flawed series, so uh, you have fulfilled the scripture, he that shall endure unto the end the same shall be saved. Uh, you've almost made it through the great tribulation. We're almost there. So go ahead and be seated. When you get there, would you just clap your hands to the Lord and use your voice to give him a loud praise. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. I worship you, Jesus. I love you. I honor you. Well, this is part 11 of a series on 1st and 2nd Corinthians called Flawed. It is the last part. We've had longer series, but not many. This is one of them. We learn a lot about the flawed church in Corinth from Acts chapter 18, and I take great delight and honor in reading this to you one final time in this series, because Acts 18 tells us how this church got started during Paul's missionary journey. It tells us how he worked with Aquila and Priscilla as a tent maker so he could preach to these people, many of whom were new to their faith, without relying on support from anybody else. And uh, he first went to the synagogue, but many of the Jews turned down the message of the gospel, and then Paul went to the Gentiles. That was his calling and his ministry. And so this church was made up of both groups, and during the 18 months that Paul spent there in Corinth um, planting this church, he faced some very terrible, powerful opposition. But we've read this every lesson. I want to read it again for the final time tonight. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision. Be not afraid, but speak and hold not thy peace. For I am with thee, I don't know about you, I'm claiming this next part for Fredericton. And no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. Anybody reach up and grab hold of that promise for us and for CCC and for Fredericton? There are a lot of people in this city that are going to come to know the Lord. It was after Paul's departure that this church developed some very serious issues, and we've chosen the word flawed. They became spiritually flawed. He had to deal with many of these problems in the letter we know as 1 Corinthians. And after they received that letter, uh, he was overjoyed to hear that God had used the epistle of 1 Corinthians to cause a majority of the church to repent. But he also was disappointed to learn that False teachers were still influencing a minority of the church. Just a small segment, but a rebellious minority is like what Paul would later write about leaven. A little leaven, a little yeast leavens the whole lump. And so uh, he, he learned that there was still a, a rebellious minority influenced by false teachers. 
and they were rejecting his apostolic authority. And that brings us to the epistle of 2 Corinthians that we've been studying. He wrote this letter to literally defend his ministry and once again try to help this flawed church. Now more than anywhere else in the Bible, more than anywhere else in any of his writings, Paul becomes very personal in 2 Corinthians. He tells things about his life in this letter that you will not encounter anywhere else in Scripture. He opens his heart, he bears his soul to this church that he loves so much. He knows he's writing to a flawed church. He knows he's writing to a divided church. And he knows some of them are being seduced by these false teachers who are making false accusations against him, even causing some of the saints to disregard and disrespect him. So it's a very difficult letter for Paul. It pains him to have to address all of this, but he knows it's necessary for their own good. He is not defending himself personally, but rather he is defending the ministry and the authority that God has given him, and he's also defending the church. He refuses to get involved with a comp in a competition with other ministers and say, I'm better, I'm higher, I'm more powerful. He refuses all of that. He refuses to promote himself. But because of the lies that are being told and because of the damage that is being done, this time around, Paul is forced to tell this church the truth. When this letter was read to the church in Corinth, I want to think, it must have brought deep shame to any of the sincere members of the church who just kind of get caught up in all that criticism and gossip because sometimes sincere, honest-hearted people get caught up by other people who want to use them uh, for their own nefarious ends. And they have been criticizing the pastor who loved them so much. Paul writes to them in this book, and this is the chapter we ended on last time. He says in chapter 10, verse 12, we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. The false teachers were going around bragging on their credentials in their ministry. He said, I wouldn't dare to compare myself with them. But they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. Can I tell you, that's not only true for preachers and pastors, that they shouldn't compare themselves uh, by themselves or among themselves. That's true for every child of God. We shouldn't be comparing ourselves and God's blessed this one and God's anointed that one. And, and here's where it gets sinister, but this is our culture in the world, so we sometimes follow it and we don't even think how harmful it is. That's my favorite. He's more anointed. That's just garbage in the kingdom of God. He says in verse 17 and 18, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. It's not the one that commends himself that is approved, but it's who the Lord commends. How about we just love everybody, and how about we just honor all the leadership that God puts in his church, and how about we just glorify the Lord for all of it and thank God for it. Now, Paul has not only been a pastor to the believers in Corinth. He's been like a father to them. He, he says in his first letter, you have a thousand, 10,000 instructors, but you don't have many fathers. I've been like a father to you. And his image here is he's like a dad with a daughter who's about to be married. And he's lovingly protecting her purity until her wedding day. And here's the comparison. The apostolic church is a bride engaged to the Lord Jesus Christ, waiting for the coming of the Lord and the marriage supper of the Lamb. And how sad it would be for the church, his bride, to be unfaithful to her beloved. But that is exactly the peril that happens to be facing the church in Corinth. So Paul says, I would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly. And indeed, please bear with me, for I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. 
because I've espoused you, I've engaged you. When you got saved and entered the apostolic church, I have engaged you, espoused you to one husband. And here's my goal. It's not to be famous. It's not for you to give me accolades. It's that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. That's my goal. That's every good, godly pastor's goal that we have a bride waiting for Jesus on the rapture day. That's our goal. So Paul says how sad it would be for you to be unfaithful. How sad it would be. And he says, I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve in the Garden of Eden through his subtlety, I'm fearing that your minds might be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Now, the devil is a liar. If you haven't figured that out yet, you need to go read John chapter 8 and verse 44. The devil is a liar and the father of a lie. And he works with subtlety. He doesn't come full frontal, bold assault. He works with subtlety to deceive us. And he wants to destroy the simplicity of our relationship with the Lord. Simplicity here means a sincere or single-minded devotion. Simplicity here means free from pretense, pretending, and hypocrisy. This is just as open and transparent and sincere as we can be. That is the simplicity of our relationship with God. Jesus is not looking for your best carbon copy of another saint. Jesus is not looking for you to pretend that everything's okay. Jesus is looking for people that transparently, with sincerity, serve him. But the devil wants to mess that up. And it's exactly what he did with Eve in the Garden of Eden. First of all, he questioned God's word. He said, has God really said that? Secondly, he denied God's word. He said, oh, you're not surely going to die. I know God said it, but it's not going to really happen. And then thirdly, he changed God's word. He, he, He said, you will be as gods. That is not what God said about them. And so that's the devil's tactic 6,000 years later, he questions God's word, he denies God's word, and then he changes God's word. And you need to beware of anybody that's doing any of the above with relation to the word of God. Satan does the same thing today by using counterfeit ministers who preach a counterfeit Jesus, a counterfeit spirit and a counterfeit gospel. They are everywhere. We just came through Easter and so many of the so-called Easter presentations at churches were uh, just so anti-gospel, anti-Bible, and anti-Jesus. They were uh, despicable and deceitful and deceptive. And uh, it's everywhere in our culture. Counterfeit money is close to the original, otherwise you wouldn't be fooled by it. Counterfeit money looks like the original, it feels like the original, but folks, it is not the original. And that's why Paul warns the the Corinthians, don't you fall into the devil's trap. Now, if you think I'm being a little harsh, here's Paul in verse 4 of chapter 11. For if he that cometh preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit which you have not received in the past, or another gospel which you have not accepted, what I'm afraid of is you might well bear with him. You might put up with that nonsense that people are subtly changing the message and the experience of the apostolic church, and you might put up with it. That's what he's afraid of. Paul speaks very plainly in this chapter, and he calls out, these false apostles and deceitful workers. That's what he calls them. Because they have mesmerized the Corinthians with their clever oratory. They even, these false teachers, they even mocked Paul. Apparently Paul was not a very gifted preacher. Uh, He says in chapter 10, verse 10, they say about him, his bodily presence is weak and his speech is is contemptible. That's what they say about him. But Paul, he agrees with them. He says in chapter 11, verse 6, though I be rude in speech, I'm not a great preacher, I'm not eloquent, I'm not an orator, uh, I'm rude in speech. 
They say it about him. He says it about himself. And can I tell you tonight very clearly, that has nothing to do with who is a true and effective minister of the gospel. We have a saying. I don't know if anybody else uses it, but I've heard it around our uh, apostolic fellowship for many years. People will say, that guy couldn't preach his way out of a paper bag. You ever heard anybody say that? What they're saying is he's not a real effective communicator. But can I tell you something? There are apostles that have gone into nations where there were no churches and when they left there was a massive church with all kinds of ministers and all kinds of Bible colleges and all kinds of saints and preachers and we would say about them, if you heard them, you would say he couldn't preach his way out of a paper bag. Sometimes we mess up with missionaries here in North America. They come through, and because they don't preach as eloquent as somebody we heard at a conference, we think, well, they're not a very good preacher. They weren't wired to preach to us here. They were wired by God to take the gospel to their nation, and in that nation, they're an apostle. In that nation, they're raising up works all over the place. So could we stop evaluating people as though it was a TED Talk? This is not a TED Talk. This is the apostolic church. And so that's what Paul's after here. And he uses the word transform three times in this section to uncover their sinister tactics. The Greek word here means to change appearance or to disguise or to masquerade. Here's what he says, uh, verse 13. For such are false apostles. They're deceitful workers. They transform, they disguise themselves. They transform themselves into the apostles of Christ and they fool people. And no marvel, it's no wonder that they can do this for Satan himself is transformed. He's disguised as an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing, it's no hard task if his ministers also be transformed, disguised, masquerade as the ministers of righteousness. But Paul said, but their end shall be according to their works. God's going to look after them. But in the meantime, we've got to be intelligent enough and spiritually aware enough to recognize what is true, what lines up with the word of God, and what doesn't. Now, Paul's obviously... You read these chapters and he's obviously uncomfortable talking about his own accomplishments in ministry, but he is compelled to defend this church that he loves against these imposters because that's what they are. And so his words right here drip with intended irony. He gets a little sarcastic. Here's what he's about to say. I'll give you the modern Woodward version and then we'll read the King James. Here's what Paul's about to say. Since boasting seems to be the in thing in Corinth, I'll boast. That's what he just said. Uh, Here's what he says. Seeing that many glory after the flesh, I'll glory also. For you suffer fools gladly. You suffer all these people to come in and preach and you don't even discern that they're wrong or they're false. Seeing you you yourselves, you're so wise. He's being very, very sarcastic. So uh, I, I like that because I have a gift of sarcasm that operates sometimes in my life and I try to keep it under control most of the time. We are about to learn things here about Paul's ministry that he never mentions anywhere else. It's amazing the hardships this man went through to preach the gospel. The book of Acts records much of this era of church history, about 40 years of it. So about half of the first century. The book of Acts records only one beating that Paul received, only one stoning that he endured, and only one shipwreck. That's the book of Acts. It says nothing about the other dangers that Paul encountered during his travels. He lived his life as a marked man. People were constantly trying to criticize him, trying to undermine him, trying to attack him, trying to imprison him, and trying to kill him. And so he just wades in here. You like boasting in Corinth? You like all these people that brag about their accomplishments? Okay, let me tell you what I've gone through. Are they ministers of Christ? And then he he can't help it. He said, I'm just speaking as a fool. I'm not really serious or sincere about this. But if you want to play the comparison game, let's play. 
Are they ministers of Christ? I am more. In labors, more abundant. In stripes, above measures. In prisons, more frequent. In deaths, often. Of the Jews, five times, not once, five times received I 40 stripes save one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I've been in the deep, out in the ocean, cast adrift. In journeyings often. And then just in traveling in that era, there were perils. I've been in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among these crazy false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. But by far, the greatest, heaviest burden Paul carried was not any of that. It was rather his deep concern for all of the churches, including Corinth. Paul never got a break from it because it went far beyond his external circumstances. It was an internal pressure on that man of God. It was an internal pressure on that apostle. It was an internal pressure on that pastor that the saints in Corinth didn't see, didn't understand, and sadly, they didn't value. Here's what he said. Beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily. All of those other things, sometimes I'm in a peril over here, sometimes I'm beaten, sometimes I'm in prison. Those are temporary. They're difficult, but they're temporary. But let me tell you, the heaviest burden I carry is what comes on me every day, and it is the care of all the churches. You see, in Corinth, they didn't value the man of God that he had given them. In Corinth, they didn't value the role of that pastor that had raised up that church and was shepherding that church. They didn't appreciate any of it. Saints of God, um, and by the way, we're all saints of God. All, every pastor you've ever met is a saint of God. Every apostle or prophet or evangelist, every missionary, we're all saints of God. But saints of God, we need to value the pastors that God has given to his church to lead us and to shepherd us and to care for us. And we need to get behind them. We need to lift up their hands. We need to pray for them. We need to follow them. We need to honor them. That's only right because they carry something we don't see and it is the care of the church Every day. So Paul's reluctant to talk about that, and he's equally reluctant to talk about all the unique spiritual experiences that he had that validated his apostleship. In fact, he's so reluctant to say what I'm about to read to you that he describes all of this experience in the third person. He doesn't say, I experienced this. He talks in the third person. He said, I knew a man in Christ that experienced this. He's talking about himself. It is not expedient for me, doubtless to glory. I will come. I'm going to move now since we're bragging and boasting. I'll now move to visions and revelations of the Lord because I've had them. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. This happened a decade and a half previously. Whether it was in the body, I cannot tell, or whether out of the body, I cannot tell. God knows. I don't know if God physically took me to heaven or whether it was a vision. I don't know. Such an one, this man that I'm talking about, that's really himself, he was caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man. Oh, yeah, he knew him well. He saw him in the mirror every day. I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. Only God knows. How that this man, this guy I'm talking about, he was caught up into paradise and he heard unspeakable words which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such an one I will glory. Yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. I'm going to brag about that guy. He's talking about himself. Let me brag about that guy that I knew about 14 years ago that was caught up into the heavens and saw a vision of the third heaven. I'll brag about him. I won't brag about me. I'll tell you what I'll brag about in me. I'll brag about my infirmities. I'm not going to brag about all my successes. I'm going to brag about all of my setbacks. I'm going to brag about all of my problems. That's what I'll brag about. Now, he's talking about a literal vision that he had, and visions were not unusual for Paul. He saw many of them. 
Um, Acts 9 and Acts 22 record that he had a vision of the glorified Jesus on the day he was converted. He also had a vision that same time describe, excuse me, describing the disciple Ananias who was sent to, being sent to pray for him. God showed him this guy that was coming to pray for him. He also had a vision in Acts 22 directing him to leave Jerusalem and go preach to the Gentiles. He saw that in a vision. He had a vision calling him to come over to Macedonia and help us. That's Acts uh, Acts 16. And then he had a vision in the middle of a shipwreck. He's having a vision and God speaks to him and says, Paul, don't worry. Everybody on this ship's going to be saved. That's Acts 27. And he had more than one vision encouraging him to continue in ministry Despite opposition and persecution, uh, there's one in Acts 18, there's one in Acts 23. He had all of these visions. It's amazing, really. Uh, And I've got friends that kind of lean into prophetic ministry, and they have visions and dreams. Uh, It's really quite amazing to me. Uh, That's not my gifting, but I'm so thankful that those people and those giftings are in the body of Christ, and some of them have some very significant dreams and visions. Paul had many of them. But none of these visions could compare to the vision of heaven that he records here. This vision happened much earlier in Paul's ministry, above 14 years ago. And it was so overwhelming that he couldn't even tell whether it was actually a vision or an actual out-of-body experience. He doesn't know. The third heaven was the way the Jews would describe paradise, where human spirits go to rest after death while they await God's eternal kingdom. And so just like John the Revelator, Paul saw all of this. It was so amazing. The only way to describe heaven's glories was with unspeakable words, he says. In other words, it was beyond my imagination. I don't have adequate words in my language to tell you what I saw. But here's the point. Paul, the great apostle, was so humble before God that he said absolutely nothing about that vision for over 14 years. He never mentioned it to anyone for over 14 years. He wouldn't be mentioning it now, except this church is on the rocks and they're being influenced by false teachers who are bragging about all the visions they've seen and people are being deceived. If it was not for that, you can rest assured, Paul probably would have taken this vision with him to his grave. He never talked about it for almost a decade and a half. He was so humble, but he was powerfully, mightily used by God. In fact, Paul didn't like to talk about any of the glories he had seen, he preferred to talk about his infirmities. This is one of the most powerful passages in 2 Corinthians. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations God gave me, in case I'd get a big head, in case I'd get proud of myself and my little ministry, in case I'd start to think I really was something, I really did have authority, and I really did have a position in the body of Christ, and I really was better than a whole lot of other people in ministry, just in case that would happen, and I'd be exalted above measure. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh. It was the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. It was so bad, Paul said. It was so awful and painful and terrible that three times I besought the Lord. I don't think that means he prayed about it three times. I mean, I think there were three times that he went into intense prayer and fasting, begging God, please let this depart from me. That's what Paul did. No doubt Paul's heavenly vision was one of the things that sustained him during his ministry, as he faced all of this persecution, as he dealt with his own physical impediments, and as he dealt with uh, punishment and imprisonment and opposition and persecution. No matter what he was going through, he could remember that vision of heaven and he could rejoice in the Lord always. But the vision was so powerful and so spectacular and so spiritual and awesome That God allowed Paul to have a thorn in the flesh. We have no idea what that was. 
But it must have been severe because the Greek word for thorn here means a stake used for torture. So it was certainly some kind of affliction that caused Paul to suffer a lot of physical pain, a lot of emotional distress, and some very real, serious limitations. Other than that, we don't know what this was. But God permitted Satan to afflict Paul in the very same way that he allowed the devil to afflict Job. In Paul's case, Satan was allowed to buffet him. That literally means to beat or to strike with a fist over and over again. It indicates recurring or constant pain. Paul prayed three times. He besought the Lord for deliverance and healing. But God chose to give him something else. I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And God didn't give me the answer I wanted. He said unto me, My grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in your weakness. So Paul says, Most gladly, therefore, I will rather glory in my infirmities. If this is what it takes for the power of God to rest on me, if this is what it takes to have his anointing, I will rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I actually have come to the place. I've matured in Christ to the point that I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. Because here's what I've learned over a lifetime of living for Jesus, over a lifetime of leading churches. Here's what I've learned. When I am weak, then am I strong. Would to God we could all learn that lesson a little better. Paul asked three times, God, please give me deliverance and healing, but instead God chose to give him grace and strength to deal with it. And Paul learned to be content regardless of his situation because he learned firsthand, I can endure all things through Christ which strengthens me. He knew God was allowing his trials to work for him, not against him. Paul was not dependent on God explaining everything to his satisfaction. He wasn't dependent on God's explanations. He was dependent on God's promises. And God had promised, I will be with you. You just keep speaking. You just keep working. I am with you. And because of that confidence, unshakable in God. All of the trials Paul encountered didn't even slow him down. Imagine an apostle traveling in that day 2,000 years ago. Perils everywhere. Robbers waiting along every roadside. Difficult travel conditions. Having to ford uh, raging rivers sometimes. And, and long, long dreary days on dirt roads across countrysides. And climbing across hills and small mountains. And going through different territories where it was risky. And he did all that to preach the gospel. Imagine. And then constant chronic pain. Every single day of his ministry. And it didn't even slow him down. Maybe sometime in all of that, somebody came up to Paul at a church meeting somewhere and said, oh, Paul, I'm so happy for you because someday you'll see heaven and you'll get rid of this thorn. And Paul would have replied to them, oh, no, I saw heaven and that's why I have this thorn. It was my experience in God that gave me this. God put this in my life so I wouldn't get too big for my britches. So I wouldn't get too smug in my ministry. So I wouldn't get too confident in my anointing. I accept the blessings God has given me. But I also accept the burdens God has given me. Now don't you think Paul is some sadistic kind of person? He doesn't take pleasure in pain. But he takes pleasure in pain for Christ's sake. 
And here's why. This is the punchline. This is what applies to us. None of us are the Apostle Paul. None of us traverse Asia Minor carrying the gospel 2,000 years ago. But here's where we are the same. When we are weak, then God is strong in our lives. When we can't see our way through, that's when we trust the one who makes a way where there is no way. When we don't understand the pain or the heartache or the loss or the setback or the opposition, that's when we reach out to the one who sustains us through the unsustainable and gets us through the unimaginable and carries us through the unbearable. That's when we trust in God the most. So we can all say with Paul, I have been weak, but when I am weak, that's when God has to be the strongest in my life. I rely on him more. I trust him more. And to be very honest, I see him show up more in my life when I am weak. We should lift your hands and just pray for a moment out loud with your voice, just for a moment. Because somebody listening to this, either in this sanctuary or somebody else watching online, you're weak right now. Please hear me when you are weak. If you'll allow him, God can show himself strong in your life. I know you don't understand your trial. I know you don't comprehend your pain. I know you don't understand the opposition. I know you don't comprehend the emotional Uh, trauma that you're going through but when you are weak that's when God can show up and be strong in you and when he's strong you're going to get through it and when he bears his strong arm you're going to come out a victor and you're going to say like Job though he slay me yet will I trust him watch me devil I don't know when I'm coming out but when I come out I'm coming forth as gold when I'm weak he's strong I'm sorry, we we just, one more time. Lift up your hands and lift up your prayer. Lift up your voice. Lift up your words to the Lord right now. (laughs) You are not alone. Jesus is walking with you through the trials you're facing. You are not alone. Jesus is negotiating this storm with you. The master of the wind and the waves is in the boat of your life. And at any moment, he can stand up and say, peace be still. So you just keep trusting him. And you just keep walking with him. Because when you are weak, he is strong. I'm sorry, we usually do this at the end. Would you reach over to somebody that's sitting beside you and put your hand on them and and just pray with them right now. Pray for them, pray with them. Just call your name, their name, his name. When you are weak, God is strong. Oh, 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 yes, Jesus. And if you are going through it for the sake of the gospel, if they are mocking you for the sake of the gospel, if they are persecuting you for the sake of the gospel, if they've shunned you because of the gospel, your reward is going to be magnificent in heaven. You can't even give a cup of cold water in the name of the Lord, but what there's a great reward. Oh, thank you, Jesus. I love you, God. I love you, God. I love you, God. I love you, God. Paul says, now you've done it. You've compelled me to become a fool in glorying. You've compelled me to brag and tell you about all these experiences. This is there's some sad things in this chapter. He said, "I ought to have been commended of you. You should have been bragging on your pastor, not making your pastor brag about himself." 
For in nothing am I behind the very chiefest apostles, though really I know I'm nothing. It's all God. The saints in Corinth should have been boasting about their pastor, but instead they were boasting about the super apostles, the chiefest apostles who had won their affection through deceit and were now damaging the church and they didn't even recognize it. Paul was not inferior to any of these men. In fact, it was only because of his ministry that the Corinthians were even saved and that there was a church in Corinth for these false apostles to come through and preach and impress everybody. But after all Paul's efforts on their behalf, the Corinthians took the apostle for granted and they didn't even appreciate all of his sacrifices. And that brings us to what I think is perhaps the saddest verse in all of Paul's epistles, right here. I will very gladly spend and be spent for you. I'll work hard. I'll give my life. But the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. I don't understand why I can give and sacrifice and work so hard and pray so much and serve you. And the more abundantly I love you, the less you seem to love me in return. That, brothers and sisters, is a tragedy right there. And Paul went through it. Now, Paul wanted to make another visit to Corinth, but he was concerned that when he got there, he'd heard the reports. He was concerned he'd find the same sins that he had already addressed still running rampant in the church because of these false teachers. And obviously, if Paul shows up and all those sins are still there, it's going to lead to a confrontation. This is something that you might want to store away in your memory somewhere. False ministers hardly ever deal with sin. They hardly ever preach about sin because they're only in ministry for the money and the perks. But Paul was a pastor. You hear me, if you don't hear anything else in this whole series, real pastors confront sin. Period. Full stop. End of story. If you've got a pastor, and we do, that dares to stand in this pulpit, and he does, and dares to preach how we need to live on the straight and narrow to be ready for the coming of the Lord, you want to go home and pray for your pastor every day that week, and thank God that you are blessed and privileged to have a man of God that is courageous in a time when everybody else is caving in. Paul says, I fear lest... When I come, if I come to visit, I shall not find you such as I would, and that I shall be found unto you such as you would not. There's going to be a confrontation. You're not going to like me. I'm not going to like you. Lest there be debates, debates, envyings, wrath, strifes, backbitings, whisperings, swellings, tumults, and lest when I come again, my God will humble me among you. I'll just launch into a prayer meeting, an intercession, that I shall bewail many which have sinned already and have not repented of the uncleanness and fornication and lasciviousness which they have committed. What a mess of carnality there was in this flawed church in Corinth. What a victory it was for the devil that it was turning out this way. And what a loss for God's kingdom, this church that could have been so much more influential. And I just read you the King James. I've looked up all the meanings. Let me kind of give you Paul's laundry list of faults and flaws and sins in this church. Fighting, favoritism, anger, disunity, criticism, gossip, pride, tensions, impurity, sexual sin, and loose living. That's lasciviousness. And they had not repented for it. And that's why Paul had a problem. And he dared to tell them so. And I thank God for men of God like that. I was raised under the ministries of men of God like that. And so were many of you that have been around the church at least as long as I have. Don't honor all of our pioneers and elders of the past who preached against sin with a thundering voice. If you can't get behind your pastor when he preaches against sin in this generation. Paul said, this is the third time I'm coming to you. I'm about ready to make my third visit back to Corinth. 
In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. I told you before, and I foretell you as if I were present the second time, and being absent now, I write to them which heretofore have sinned, and to all other, that if I come again the third visit, I will not spare. It's not going to be pleasant unless you deal with this. You know better, Corinth. The next time he visits Corinth, Paul declares, I will not spare you. I will not spare those who are damaging the church. And since it will be his third visit, this is a little intricate here, but it's important for you. Since it will be his third visit, he reaches back and he quotes the Old Testament law. And he, he's, he's illustrating, this is how fair I have been to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. He's reaching back to Deuteronomy, chapter 17 and 6, chapter 19 and 15. That's where that concept occurs in the law. It's also quoted by Jesus in Matthew 18 and 16, and it's quoted by Paul himself in 1 Timothy 5 and 19. Now, here's why I take the time to do all of that. Some ministers have taught that we must have two or three scriptures before we can teach any doctrine, any holiness standard, et cetera, et cetera. And they use that phrase. It has to be in the mouth of two or three witnesses, and they use that for support. What they have completely overlooked in their misinterpretation of Scripture is that each of these verses that I, I noted for you, whether in the Old Testament or New Testament, they're not dealing with forming doctrine. They're dealing with the discipline of individuals who have sinned, whether it's the Old Testament under the law or the New Testament in the church. They have nothing to do with teaching doctrine. These verses have nothing to do with lifestyle disciplines. If the Bible looks at a conduct as unbecoming for a Christian or sinful, we would be foolish to condone that kind of conduct because we can't pick out two or three verses that forbid it. The listing of the fruit of the Spirit occurs one time in the Bible. The listing of the nine supernatural gifts of the Spirit occurs one time in the Bible. I am not willing to throw them out because there's not two or three Scripture proof texts to prove them. My question to all of these people would be, how many times does God need to say it for you to obey it? For me, that's a whole number. It's one. If God says obey it once, I'm there. I don't need a bunch of proof texts to prove it. So what they've done there, and that's a, some people do it innocently, some people do it with, with a sinister motive, saying you need two or three scriptures to prove anything that you believe. That is not true. We believe the Bible, whether it says it two times, three times, one time, or a hundred times, we believe the Bible. So that's talking about if you're going to receive a witness against somebody, you don't just take one person's word in a court of law against somebody else. You need two or three witnesses for a capital charge. So Jesus puts that in the New Testament. Paul puts that in the New Testament, that you don't take one word against somebody. You need two or three witnesses. And Paul just said, I got three witnesses for you. I was there once. I was there twice, and I'm coming the third time, and the third time there's going to be two or three witnesses, and I will not spare you. That's all he's saying here. Let's uh, conclude tonight. Since you seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, which toward you is not weak but is mighty in you, for though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. Now, that's a King James Version tongue twister. Here's what Paul's saying. You can check this out in any of the modern English translations of Scripture. Paul says, you want proof that God works through my ministry? You see my ministry as so weak? You see my ministry as so inferior to all these other people that you're uh, uh, in their fan club? You want proof? Well, let me remind you about something. Let me remind you about our Lord Jesus. He sure appeared weak when he hung on the cross, but he sure was strong when he came out of that grave. So don't always look at things on the surface. Paul had been gentle with these people that he loved. 
But he's now ready to declare war on anybody opposing apostolic ministry and authority. He says, I will not spare. And so he comes down to the end of this second letter to them, 2 Corinthians. If you've been here for the whole series, you know this is actually 4th Corinthians. There were two other letters that are lost. He's been very patient with them. And now they've made him, they've pushed him, they've almost forced him to humble and humiliate himself and tell them all these things. He's never told anywhere before, to anybody before. He's kept them, carried him in his heart as a strength to him during his trials, that vision that he saw of heaven. He hasn't talked about it to anybody for over 14 years. And now they forced his hand and they've made him tell all these personal things. And it's been hard on him. And so at the end of this second letter, 2 Corinthians, he, he talks to them and he gets very direct. Examine yourselves. You've been examining me. You've been putting me on trial. Can I just turn that around toward you, Corinth? Can I just put your face in the mirror of God's word? You've been examining me. How about examining yourselves? Examine your heart. And make sure you're really living for God. Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates? Are you overcoming sin, or are you hiding sin in your heart? Are you separated from the world, or are you fascinated by the world? Are you repentant when you fail, Or are you reprobate? Are you failing the test? Are you a castaway because you won't repent? Paul turns the tables on them. And brilliantly as he he is, he he just says, you know, I've bared my soul. I've bared my heart. I've, I've told you things I didn't even want to share. I've told you about my weaknesses. And I've told you about my trials. And I've told you about how I was embarrassed by all this persecution. One time Paul was let down over a wall in a basket. You talk about a humiliating experience. And he records it in this book. He said, I was humiliated. I was embarrassed. I was treated like some kind of uh, foolish person in my ministry. And he's bared all that. He said, how about you bear your heart right now? Are you really serving God? Are you really sincere before God? Are you really letting Jesus examine your heart? I read something earlier today. There are no secrets in the secret place. If you get in the secret place with Jesus, he will reveal and unveil the secrets of your heart. And you'll see yourself maybe like you don't want to see yourself. But once you've seen yourself as he sees you, and you've come to his mercy in repentance, He takes that and he changes you and he makes you new and it's so glorious and grand. Paul's coming down to a close and so are we. Verse 8. For we can do nothing against the truth but for the truth. (laughs) I love that verse right there. No matter how much Satan attacks... No matter how much our culture opposes, no matter how much false doctrine may flourish, no matter how much worldliness may increase, no matter how much other Christians may disappoint us, no matter how flawed the church may become, we can be confident of one thing. God's truth will always prevail and God will always have a people. You can't knock down the truth because it's God's truth. You can fight against it. You might as well beat your head against a brick wall. His truth shall prevail. We can do nothing against the truth only for the truth. So you listen to me, Corinth. It doesn't matter if you stay or go. It doesn't matter if you believe or if you deny. God's always going to have a people. I'm just presenting it to you because I dearly want you to be in that number on that final day when I present you as a chaste virgin, the bride to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what every one of your pastors wants for you. If we've ever pressed you, pushed you, challenged you, corrected you, we didn't do it because we're on an ego trip. 
We didn't do it because we think we're better than you. We did it because our calling as pastors is to present a people for his name in the city of Fredericton. We love seeing your face at CCC. The closer we get to the coming of the Lord, the more important church attendance is. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together and so much the more as you see the day approaching. I don't get people that don't love coming to church. I don't, I just, I can't comprehend them. But the most important place for us to see your face is on that final day when the church is caught up to meet him in the air. You want to know that your pastors will be looking around for your face on that day. Your most important appointment is not whatever's on your day timer for tomorrow or next week. Your most important appointment is the rapture of the church. And that's why pastors challenge us and correct us and preach to us and we thank God for it. Last verse. Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect. That's mature. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And if you'll do that, the God of love and peace shall be with you. Paul says as he closes this second letter that we have to this church. A good church, but a flawed church. A a, a church with the gifts of the Spirit, but with a lot of emotional baggage. Paul said, this will fix your flaws. Here's what will fix the flaws of any church. Grow up. That's what he says. Be perfect. Be mature. Grow up. This will fix your flaws. Be of good comfort. Stop worrying. My goodness. We had an eclipse this week. There were literally pastors and preachers and people and websites and churches and people talking about it's the rapture. There's nothing in the Bible about the sun going dark on rapture day. Goodness. I sent it to pastor. (laughs) Somebody the next day, they just put three words on their Twitter feed. Worst rapture ever. (laughs) Would you stop getting all ramped up? Yes, it's the end times. Yes, it's the last days. Yes, it's getting bad out there. Yes, the devil's working. Yes, there's false doctrine everywhere. Stay in your church. Stay in the Bible. Stay in connection with Jesus, and you're going to be fine. So you want to fix the flaws of any good church? Grow up. Stop worrying. Oh, this is good. Be unified. Be of one mind. We're not against each other. We're for each other. We're with each other. We love each other. And he says, live in peace. Stop fighting. Stop quarreling over stupid, tedious, trivial, temporal stuff. Stop quarreling. Stop fighting. Live in peace. And if you'll do that, God's love and God's peace will govern everything we do. And even great churches that have become flawed They can be restored. They can be powerful. I want our church, though we are all flawed, I want our church to be a beacon of hope to this city and far beyond. And I join the chorus of your pastors saying, we are so grateful for you. We love your love for the house of God. We love your love for the word of God. We love your love for the disciplines of the Christian life and the doctrines of the scripture. We admire you for that. But we love you too much to just kind of let you sit there. So when pastor gets up and challenges us to get involved and to do something and to pray and to serve, jump in. Enlist. Get involved. Because even flawed churches can have a massive footprint for the kingdom of God. Would you stand to your feet? Would you clap your hands? That's good. Would you give the Lord a shout of thanks and praise and honor and glory?
I worship you, Jesus. Would you lift your voice high with that and just give him glory, just give him honor. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I worship you, God. I worship you, God. And because we do honor our pastor and the pastors that serve with him, I want him to come and pray over you and dismiss you tonight. Um, I thank God for the man that stands in this pulpit and preaches the word of God to us and everyone else that helps him in that task. (laughs) Pastor, come and dismiss us. Don't you love our pastor? Great man of God. And how many are grateful for the word that we have heard? Not just tonight, but the last weeks. He, uh, he, Pastor Wilbert eases us in by saying this has been going on forever, but how many have appreciated the fact that he took time to unpack that? And, and I, would, <clears throat> I, would, I would echo that. Just before we go tonight, I just had a quick prompting in the Holy Ghost that If the word of the Lord has convicted someone tonight, I would hate for us to leave and for that moment to pass. If God has allowed the word to be a light into our lives and just reveal something that we needed to to deal with. And I know we've been praying through the lesson tonight, but how many would just pause for a moment and pray together? I feel like there's someone here that just wants to lay some things out before the Lord. I think there's someone that just wants to lay some things on the altar tonight. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your promise. God, through this lesson and through this series, you have exposed the challenges of that flawed church so we could see the challenges in ourselves. And God, you're growing us. You're bringing us into a place of perfection, God, holiness. God, you're bringing our lifestyles in order, and God, you're challenging us to submit and subject ourselves to the word of the Lord tonight. So, God, we release your word to work in this room. I I pray that somebody would allow that conviction to reorder steps, and God, that it would allow us to reframe some things that need to be fixed. I, I pray tonight, God, that you would allow someone to to see clearly because your word has been light in the midst of their life. And, and Father, tonight I pray that before we leave, someone would determine the steps that they're going to take to put things back in order. God, I pray that somebody would already begin to make intentions and pay attention to what you have opened in our minds and in our spirits tonight. God, I thank you for talking to us. I, I thank you for challenging us. We're leaving determined. God, we're leaving God, we're leaving more focused. We're leaving with better intentions. God, we're leaving with more decision behind us. God, we are making our minds up. We are determined tonight to follow after you. I thank you, God. We give you great honor and we give you great praise tonight. Someone say amen. 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 Soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. That's why we're doing it. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Oh, soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we're going to see the King. Sing it. Oh, soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. We're going to see the King. How many are grateful for that promise? Grateful for grace that's sufficient? God's not letting us walk this all by ourselves. He's going with us. He's going before us. He's coming behind us. He's on our right. He's on our left. 
How many are grateful we leave this room with focus tonight? Amen. So grateful to be a part of a powerful church like this. And uh, you're, all, you're all invited to be a part of the choir. Man alive, you sound great. If you see Brother Jonathan McNair on the way out tonight, tell him happy birthday. It's his birthday today. We love, we love the McNairs. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. God bless you tonight.